tarde a todas e a todos. Para nós é um grande prazer e uma honra ter conosco o professor Luís Gordon. Eu vou apresentá-lo em português, apesar de depois ir falar em inglês. O professor Luís Gordon está conosco neste momento, convidado. Convidámos-lo a estar na Escola de Verão do Projeto Alice e também está conosco no âmbito dos pós comunes e cidadania global. A conferência de hoje é sobre Beyond Justice, que além da justiça, sobre o que é que está a acontecer com o pensamento político hoje, à luz das grandes discussões no mundo. O problema é que o professor Louis tem vindo a referir se focamos muito na, ou na questão de fascista ou na questão neoliberal, perdemos de foco outros aspectos complicados e é nesse contexto que nos vem desafiar a pensar o contexto atual de uma forma mais ampla. O professor Louis Gordon dispensaria apresentações, até que a maior parte de vocês já o conhece. Neste momento ele é professor em Connecticut, em Stores. Uh, foi também, é também o último na Vida que me na no século de na Jean Jopé. Uh, e também da professor na, 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 na Rhodes University, na África do Sul. Antes disso já foi professor em variedíssimas universidades, Brown, etc. Mas acima de tudo ele tem uma coisa que a mim me desafiou muito, acho que não tive possibilidade de falar com ele. Ele é um drama que é a parte que eu mais gosto, na Three Generations Band. Portanto, esta é a parte para mim mais interessante, também muito interessante o trabalho dele, que está no Spotify, se algum de vocês quiser ver. Dentro das obras dele, até deu lugar muito com Fanon, que está lá, Fanon 7, a Philosophical Introduction, to His Last Name Thought, uh, e também Geopolitics and Decolonization, que é um livro. Isso foi ficar em inglês, o Tolarial. A Perspective from the Global South. São dois grandes livros, assim, está em cima da mesa. Vocês, muitos de vocês conhecem a obra, a obra está disponível em vários sites de ele ter acesso à informação. Eu deixo-vos com o professor Lois Gordon, thank you so much. I was just making a quick introduction. To your, to you and to your work. So, for is yours. 14 minutes, an hour and then discussion. Sure, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, bon dia, bon dia, it depends on where one is. And, and uh, as we say in Jamaica, how you keep it. Um, thank you for uh, uh, coming out for us to have a conversation this afternoon. I know it's summer and classes are out. So it's an extra um, honor you give me by being here. Uh, what I'm going to do is... Uh, Given already the title may be intriguing to you, Beyond Justice. And what I like to do when I give talks is to begin actually by asking you, given the title, what questions do you have come to mind? And then I will speak. And, uh, and we continue having a conversation together. Okay? And the talk itself, for those of you who would like, I'm not going to give the full paper. But the talk itself will come out in the volume that I'm co-editing with Fernando Brigato from Brazil. So it, later this fall, it will be in print. And it is, so that should, uh, for those who be interested in it, it will be available. But for now, the, um, uh, what's, um, you know, you heard I'm a musician, and I'm also a jazz musician as well as a rock and roll musician. And as you know, with jazz, although you may have a, a song, you never play it the same way twice. You work with the community to see what could occur there. In a way, that's a very good metaphor for political life. I remember, for instance, um, one time I was given a lecture in a, in a community uh, of um, people who are interested in the question of community organizing, a group of activists. But the people who organized the meeting, it was one of these big halls, and they had a piano. And I went over to play the piano, and they, and they ran up to me quickly and said, no, it's out of tune. And, uh, by the way, is everybody following me okay? So when I said, I said, no, it's not a problem. So I sat down and played the piano while we were waiting for people to gather. And after I finished playing, they were shocked and they went over and they said, um, I thought it was out of tune. 
And I looked at them, I said, it is. <laughs> and so they were perplexed. And I said, um, you know, if you are a mus if you really want to play music, uh, almost any instrument can produce music. You just adjust to the instrument and you bring out what it offers. And that's a clue from jazz. Because you see, if you think about democracies, uh, the, the error people make is they think you can impose a rigid, rigid, rigid structure on it. But if you look at democracy a lot like that piano, a democracy is a society of imperfect people, out of tune people, who are able to make music together. So, I get it together here. There are ideas I have, but we'll see what happens. So, to begin, if some of you had some questions you already came in with, why don't we begin with you, and then I will go to the formal presentation. And so, if there's any of you with that, then please say your name. Just, we'll start with you. Well, still, you never know. Okay, I'm going to talk a little. It's always fine to interrupt me, okay? Okay, I'm going to talk about some themes that are connected to a lot of what's done at this institute and Alice and a few other places across not only Portugal, but also places in the global south. Now, you hear the term decolonization all the time. You also hear about the decolonization of knowledge. And we'll be talking about that quite a bit. However, there's, there is a critique about the project of the decolonization of knowledge. And part of the critique about the project of the decolonization of knowledge is that if the decolonization of knowledge doesn't assess how it relates to the ascent of knowledge as first philosophy, then in effect, although it's giving a critique of knowledge, it's affirming the centering of knowledge as first philosophy. Okay. So, for instance, if you look at the difference between Las Casas in the Caribbean and you look at René Descartes, Las Casas responded to the crisis in the Caribbean by saying the fundamental question of our times is what does it mean to be human? Okay? But on the continent that became, well, the peninsula that became known as Europe, the response was to avoid that question and turn to the question in Descartes of philosophy as first philosophy. So the extent to which Cartesianism dominated the problems that were happening in the colonies and a lot of other places where those problems were avoided. Okay? Now, this returns in a very unusual way because when you speak with decolonial theorists, decolonial theorists are ready to go with you when you're talking about knowledge. Okay? So that's just right. We need to decolonize knowledge. We need to deal with coloniality. We need to fight these issues. You know, that sort of thing. However, many do not really address the problem of the colonization of norms, of normative <coughs> life. In other words, if you raise the question of justice, ethics, morals, many of them stop there. Because from their point of view, if you decolonize <coughs> knowledge, then you can know the right things to do. You see? But what if the very, that very argument itself is a form of colonial argument? Okay? Now, to understand this, we should bear in mind that there are many themes in the way we talk about political and normative life that we don't question today. A lot of the popular works, for instance, in contemporary political thought uh, are anti-sovereignty, they're anti-state, and we could go down a long list, but they don't interrogate what, it, what those concepts are. Okay? So if you pick, for instance, the concept of a state, Many people, when they talk about a state, they immediately move to the notion of domination, coercion, but they don't examine 
the basic roots of the concept of state in stasis. That ultimately states emerge to create stability because the argument is there are certain things human beings cannot do without a stable environment. You see? So while people argue for the eradication of the state, they don't realize the extent to which if they want to argue for stability, they may re-invoke a different kind of state. Okay? Now, as I speak, you'll find quite often I will bring up some terms, but part of the colonizing pro process is that we don't realize the extent to which we're already at an epistemological or knowledge level colonized in terms of what we expect as the outcome of an investigation. And I'll give you an example. When you often look at terms, particularly scientific and philosophical or political terms, they almost always give you an etymology or history that brings you back to either Latin or Greek. Okay? Now think about it. If you keep walking back to Latin or Greek, after a while you begin to think that thinking began in Latin or Greek. Correct? I mean, it's as if, and that becomes very weird because when you go back to Latin and Greek, you're going back to the formulation of concepts at a, that are not, at most, to the formulations are about 2,500 years. However, the human species is about 220,000 years old. So, if you use that logic, then for about 217,000 years, or maybe 2,000, the human species was basically walking around dumb. And then when you add to it that a good portion of, home, of the period of Homo sapiens, okay, would be, would be at least, at least 150,000 years on the African continent, then the attitude about being on the African continent is one of this. Maybe a grunt. <clears throat> and then one miraculous day, a toenail steps on what will be future Europe. And suddenly it's, you know, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. My God, I'm thinking about philosophy, Pythagoras, knowledge, ideas. Wow, this European soil is amazing. Okay? So one of the things you're going to see me do is to say the obvious. You see, when you go and you look at those Latin and Greek formulations, they in their time, were referring also to ancients, to people who preceded them. And in their world, when they thought of up, up was Africa. And when they thought of down, it was what would be today, today, Northern Europe. Okay? So up was south, <laughs> down was north. And even before then, logically, humanity didn't even think about north and south. They thought east and west for the obvious reason, that where the sun rises and where the sun sets. So, it took, so these are very important to understand the organization of norms and knowledge, okay? Well, quite often when I would go further and look at the language, you would find that there are other languages that would inform the concepts that we use in Latin and Greek. And quite a number of those concepts were not only Persian and Hebrew, but in some cases, in many cases in fact, there were also Mudanetur. And for those of you who don't know what Mudanetur is, it's the actual language of the people of a place called ancient Kamet. And if you don't know what ancient Kamet is, well, Kamet was a place that when it was later colonized, by Macedonians. One of its cities, Memphis, was changed to its Greek name, Egepsos. 
And when the colonization became dominated over the northern Mediterranean, the whole area was renamed Egypt. Okay? So what so that's the that's a, an early point at least about how we think about terms. Now the fact that I open that way means that I invite you to think not in, in an isolated way, but think relationally. In other words, when we discuss certain concepts, we have a tendency to discuss the concepts in a way similar to the way I made the joke about stepping on European soil. We treat concepts as if they come out of thin air instead of a whole process of human negotiation and relationships. Okay? This is very crucial because there are certain shifts that occurred historically that affect the way we talk about concepts. And one of the shifts is the way we even talk about colonization. Because if we talk about colonization and also concepts like modernity, in a way that keeps us locked into the 15th and 16th century, then we begin to treat those concepts as if they are equivalent with Europe. You see? So, it's a, so if Europe becomes modernity, we never go to the next move of talking about Euro-modernity. If you say Euro-modernity, then there are other kinds of modernity. If you say Euro-colonization, it means there are other kinds of colonization. And once we understand the specificity of that, then the world opens up. We have to ask a different question about what it means to study colonization, in the particular the one that emerged in what created Europe. Now to do this, it requires another concept, which is going to be at the core of what I'm going to be talking about. There are several things today that many people um, don't do, but claim they do, okay? And this is because of the emergence and the transition from material capitalism to knowledge capitalism. And with knowledge capital, the very idea of theory as a commodity to sell emerged. So in the academy today, there are many people who sell theory before even knowing what theory is. So if you look at a lot of what is presented as theory across the, the hegemonic academies, the dominating academies, if you interrogate them, they're not actually theory. What they are, are assertions or positions instead of theory. So most people would say when they do theory, they're really announcing what their positions on issues are. But that is not a theory, you see? And what often, when you look at those positions, those positions are moral positions. So what happens is a confusion of theory with, mora with morality, and it collapses into what I call moralism. Now moralism is a very tricky thing to deal with. Because moralism, basically then, almost always has within it a logic of purity and, uh, and, and, and a form of logic that ultimately creates something always wrong with others instead of the self. Okay? So the moralist or the moralistic individual would often, would often um, um, condemn others for failing to be like the moralist. In other words, the problem with you and everybody else becomes you're not like me. Of course, the problem with that logic is that once you've eliminated everybody else because they're not moral enough, then you have to deal with yourself. And if you're not moral enough, you know what you've got to do. You've got to take yourself out back and shoot yourself. Now, this comes about in rather interesting ways. So, um, and one of the ways it comes out is that it tends to work very well within what we call neoliberalism, okay? Now, within what passes off as theory in the academy today, 
there are two currents that dominate. There are others, but there are two dominating currents, and I'm only going to talk about one. The two dominating models are neoliberalism, or some form of liberalism, and the other is post-structuralism. That tends to be connected to some form of postmodernism. The fundamental issue with post-structuralism, especially in its postmodern variety, is an in advance announcement of being anti essentialist. Okay? Now, that leads to a very strange contradiction. Because if you're going to say you're anti essentialist before you encounter a particular phenomenon, then you have actually made a decision about the phenomenon before, you, before knowing what the phenomenon is. In effect, then, that's an essentialism of the a priori. You see what I'm saying? So in effect, anti-essentialism is an essentialism. So that's one part. But the neoliberal part is a more complicated matter. Now, and the reason I'm putting the post-structuralism side to the side for the moment is because, you see, there's a seduction in the neoliberal side. And the seduction in the neoliberal side is connected to what a lot of people erroneously look for in theory. And I'm going to spell that out, okay? Now, the, to understand this, you know earlier when I said the fundamental issue about the state is about stability. Well, this issue is the core issue that addresses, in our times, the distinction between the right and the left, okay? The right, basically, is basically uh, committed exclusively to the question of order, stability, and security. And I think the best critical statement on the right was made by Ortega y Gazette. Ortega y Gazette was a Spanish philosopher. You know, he was, part of the, he was among the Republicanists, not the American variety, of course. And he was fighting against the fascists. <coughs> and what Ortega y Gazette pointed out is that what the right basically asks you is a simple question. How much are you willing to give up for security? And what the right would do is they eventually say, are you willing to give up civil liberties? Give up freedom? Give up, give up, give up. So after a while, you see what I'm getting at? You're under authoritarian control. Everything with the right is about about that question of right of order. The other issue about the right is, in a way, even though the terms right and left are arbitrary, they came out of the French Parliament, it was seating arrangements. Sometimes, psychoanalytically, things match out in a similar way, because right is led to rect rectitude and those things. The right also has a certain position about the present. When the right is dissatisfied with the present, the right always says it's because the past was better. So that's why all right-wing movements lead to a valorized or romanticized past. And that is usually transformed into the language of tradition. So that's the right, okay? Now we get to what we call the left. Now, the error we make when we do a lot of political analyses is we treat the right and the left, uh, I guess I'm doing theater here because I'm using my left hand, but it's your right and the left. They, the tendency is to treat them as symmetrical, as two sides of the same thing. But that's a mistake because, you see, the logic of one is, is different from the logic of the other. If I were to hold up these two containers, this is symmetry, even though they're different objects, because they're both containers with fluids. Same logic. However, the left is a very different logic. To understand what the left is, the logic begins with a dissatisfaction of the present. But what the left says is that the past was a better. The past is simply a collection of efforts to make things better. Which means that if you want to make the present better, you have to look for the future. You see? So all left movements are future-oriented. 
But, as we know, the left is never just the left. There's the liberal left, there's the radical left, and different kinds of radical left, for instance, Marxist radical left, right? And there's the anarchic left. In fact, the left is always premised on, upon this idea that if something new or different can come into the world, it must be because of the possibility of freedom. And this is where it becomes tricky. Because some people on the left take the position that freedom is about liberty. And, all right, and then there are others who take the position that no, freedom is about responsibility. And then there are those who say that freedom is about being able to do whatever you want to do, for which the others have a criticism. They say that's not freedom, that is license. If you're free, it doesn't mean that you have a license, for instance, to be a schmuck. Some people talk about, for instance, free speech. But they're not actually interested in free speech. They're interested in licensed speech. Because some kinds of speech really can harm people, literally lead to the death of people. Whereas freedom is about recognizing your responsibility for others. Now, the liberal... Left. The problem with the liberal left is the liberal left tends to argue that the uncertainty about freedom means that you have to develop a logic of toleration. This means the liberal has to tolerate the anarchist and the conservative. Now the problem with the conservative we've already seen, if you push the right to the extreme, if you give up all your liberties, you have fascism. If you go to the far extreme on the other position, you have anarchy. But the problem that the liberal has with the fascist is the liberal is compelled to tolerate the fascist, but the fascist doesn't have to tolerate the liberal. So if the fascist kills the liberal, the fascist just says, hey, I'm fascist. <laughs> you see? So it's completely consistent. That's why a lot of the arguments today between the right and the liberals are stupid. The liberals will lose. Okay? Now, another problem with liberals is that liberalism often collapses into an individualism. And this emerges from part of the logic of modern capitalism. Because the logic of modern capitalism, and I'm going to get to it in a minute, is based upon something that, would, that refuses to recognize a category of rights that we can call group rights. So what happens is this. Because the individuals won't, I mean the liberalism, will only look at the individual, then a certain philosophical anthropology emerges. Remember in the beginning I said Las Casas saw the problem as philosophical anthropology? Las Casas was not a liberal. You see? But the liberal emerges in such a, with a philosophical anthropology that gives the individual the sense that the individual can do something about the world around her or him. Now the problem here is really think about this. If you purely as an individual can get things done, you have to be one really powerful individual. In other words, the problem that many liberals don't see with the liberal conception of the self and of human beings is that that's not a human being. That individual is a god. You see? And this leads to a problem in liberalism. How do you now get the system to work? Now, here's where the issue gets very tricky. Um, first, let me bring up another kind of liberalism, neoliberalism. A lot of people talk about neoliberalism, but they don't talk about neoconservatism. And neoconservatism, I've already, in a way, outlined. But neoliberalism emerges out of something that was peculiar at the same time that you have Las Casas, and you have people like Descartes, and you have people like Hobbes, you have all of these things happening. And to understand this, you need to take a moment, the way I told the story, 
about language and think about the story of markets. If you look today, people talk a lot about the market, don't they? You hear about the market, you hear, and people talk about capitalism. And in fact, when people talk about the market, they always talk about the market and capitalism as the same thing. The problem with that is markets have been around as long as there have been people. The markets have been around more than 100,000 years. And in fact, if you use the term markets in the plural, the first thing you would know about markets, especially if you go across the continent of Africa, you go across the Caribbean, but even if you look at the history of this country, I mean, before there was a formal Portugal, but Iberia. All markets prior to the market we know of as capitalist market had something in common. Markets existed in a world in which we didn't have the internet, we didn't have newspapers, we didn't have banks. You see what I'm getting at? Markets when people would, were where people would meet, and when people meet, what was traded were ideas, news, goods, other things. But the main reason people met in markets was to meet people. Markets historically were humanistic places of meeting. And so the idea, you didn't go to the market for a profit. Markets were places where you found out about your neighbors. You found out about new inventions. You, you know, people say, what's that? Oh, it's, it's an ax. What's that? It's, it's a net. What do you do with that? Catch fish. What do you do with an ax? Chop trees. Hmm. Maybe I could make more efficient nets with an ax. Wow, maybe if I have a net, I could throw it on the mammoth. <laughs> you know? And it's, that's how it spreads. Well, when, when cap, what led to a different logic was certain individuals said the problem with markets was that markets were too human. What if you took the humanity out of markets? Now markets began to be, what became the focus of markets became efficiency, production, and profit. You notice none of those three terms are really required, really think about. They, they diminish the role of human beings. So a form of anti-humanism is in the market. In fact, the greatest fantasy of the market model, capitalism, is a way to achieve all those things without people. And that's why robots are a fantasy. All kinds of diminish people. So neoliberalism has within it an added element, the notion of a free market. In other words, to fetishize the market, to get rid of people, and part of that was the valorization of privatization. So in effect, the market, in order to justify itself as the market, must thus have no limitation. Now in my writings, I call this the theodicy of the market. It means the market functions like a god, an absolute god. Now, that means that the historical sites of resistance to the market must be colonized by the market. You got it? One historical site was knowledge. All right? The academic, the site of knowledge, was supposed to be that which you have over the market, knowledge of the market, not the market colonizing the knowledge. So for the market to be fully operational, it needed to conquer or colonize the production of knowledge. The next thing was the market had to regulate not just knowledge, but it had to make another level. The next level was one place in which there was resistance to the market was politics. Because the idea is you can politically control the market or at least make sure you make a decision of where the limit of the market was. So if the market became absolute, the market had to demand the marketability of politics. And that has happened, by the way. Many, not only academics, but there are many people in the world who sell as a commodity themselves as political figures. Okay? So once we have this, now the question is, but how does 
the, that move colonized politics. You see? And the answer to that is through morality. Okay? Now, how does this occur? Well, I give you a simple, first I give you an example, and then I'll, I'll get more into it. I, I was given a lecture one time where a woman raised her hand. She was an environmental activist. And she said, you know, we can really protect the environment if people would just learn to be more moral. So I asked her a question. I, said, I asked her, I said, what would bother you more? To be considered immoral or stupid? I'm curious. What would bother you more? If you raise your hand, to be considered immoral or stupid? Let's start with it. Immoral, would that bother you more? Okay, stupid. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> now, you could see, and, and you know what? Guess what her answer was? It would bother her more to be considered stupid. So, you could see how this, where I was going with this. If a system made it stupid to do what is moral, then you could explain the banking, the banking crises. You could see a lot of the medical crisis. You could see in many professions a lot of the maledictions in the world. In fact, here's something I consider hilarious. All across the world right now, there are people teaching. I'm not kidding. You know this. There are people who teach and specialize in business ethics. Really think about this. <laughs> a future will come where people will look back and say, what? Because you see the point, right? That story I just told about the market. Business is going to say if it's business or it, it, to lose profit and be ethical. <laughs> in fact, you could imagine in the future people going to a museum, and they see a diorama, and you see the professor and the classmate, and the <laughs> students ask, what's that? And the guard says, business ethics. <laughs> and they're like, yeah? So how does, you know, so, so we see this absurdity. Okay, so, so what's going on here? Well, to understand this, I'm going to get into a, to, to, I'm not, as I said, the problem, the lecture will be too long if I get into the postmodern, post-structural stuff. So now I'm just, I'm, I'm going to just now just go through three moves, okay? I'm going to just talk about liberal political philosophy. Then I'm going to talk about um, um, the, the critical position from global south thought. I prefer not to say decolonial thought, but global south, and you'll see why. And then I'm going to conclude with what I mean by beyond justice. Okay? So if we start with the question of liberal political philosophy, it's pretty clear what I'm outlining is liberal political theory. Now, with, there are many people I could talk about. And one of the sad things is what has happened in the academy is there are a lot of people who are actually the, the agents of liberal political, what's called liberal political theory. But a lot of the people who study them don't even realize that. So a lot of people would specialize, especially there are certain European thinkers that are presented as if they're radical emancipators, when in fact their thought is very conservative. And a lot of people don't realize this. Okay? And in our discussion I could spell out who, but I'm going to pick one, just one, because nobody is known more for liberal political theory than this man. Okay? And his name was John Rawls. Okay? And you know John Rawls wrote a book called A Theory of Justice, where he said, you know, behind the veil, veil of ignorance, you can come upon two principles. You have a principle, the libertarian principle, and you have the, the differential pr principle, where you're dealing with the question of how you can have justice, and he said justice is fairness. Okay? That's John Rawls. Now, I'm not going to get into details of theory. I'm just going to bring two important criticisms that are crucial here, okay? Um, the first criticism, which is the one that's at the heart of this talk, is that if you read John Rawls's work, John Rawls simply announces 
that justice is the primary virtue of all social institutions. He just does it and then he moves on. Now, what is strange about this is he gives no explanation for why. Go and look it up. There's no argument for why justice is the primary virtue of social institutions. He just says it and just moves on and builds his theory of justice and fairness. Now, I, there are a lot of beautiful things about law. So, I mean, I teach a course called Social and Political Philosophy where I address this issue. So my aim here is not so much to attack or beat up laws. My aim here is to question why do we just accept this as axiomatic? We just accept this and move on. We don't talk, we don't raise maybe health. Do you know what I mean? Compassion. There are all kinds of things that we would love in social institutions. Respect. But why justice? He just says justice and moves on. But the second criticism I have is that John Rawls's theory is not a political theory. Most of liberal political philosophy is not a political philosophy. That's the, the crucial reason for this talk. You see? And, a, and, and it's to the point where a lot of people simply accept that model of doing what's called political. A lot of people think if you call something something, it is. <laughs> Right? Like, here's an example. All, you, you've all heard this expression, the politics of identity, and identity politics. You've all heard this, right? It's complete nonsense. Because if you really flesh it out, where, where's the politics in it? They're really confusing moralistic attachment to identities with politics. A lot of times when people talk about something as identity politics, it's when people to people individually are arguing. You don't see policy, you don't see institutions, you don't see governing agencies. It's almost all about moral exchange, you see what I'm saying? So it's not politics, but what's fascinating about our times is you could say politics of anything and people think it's political. Politics of ham. Politics of... Well, that might be called paella. <laughs> <laughs> well, that can be very political. Can be very. <laughs> but a lot of people, but a lot of when people talk about politics, they don't realize they're not talking about politics. So John Rawls claimed he's doing a political theory. And so, and so we already the, the first one is very easy because the fact that I even brought it up, you see the problem. If he hasn't given an argument for why justice is the primary virtue of social institutions, then he has a lot of work to do. So I don't even have to prove, because he says it. That one's easy. But now let's look at the second one. Now, I teach a course called, when I teach social and political philosophy, I actually take on that issue. I, I, there's a graduate seminar I teach where we, we begin by looking at that we look at Rawls's effort to defend his position, and then we look at all the people who try to work through that, like Iris Marion Young, uh, and then we look at the way Habermas tries to do it as well in his dialogical theory. That's part of the course, and they fail. They all fail. And then I'm just giving you a sense of the course. If you want, I'll send you. If just email me, I'll send you the syllabus. Then we look at what's missing in that. You look at some of the critics, feminist critics, you look at critics in race theory. But the problem is not that the feminist critics and critics in race theory are working on the underlying assumption of that way of doing political theory and political philosophy. So they fail for a similar reason. The details of why, it's too short a time to be able to stop. But then I look at people from the global south. And again, I'm not a person who's who believe in disciplinary nationalism or standpoint theory. So that's not why. But there's a vibrant di discourse in the global south that addresses the absence in these other models. So let me get to what that is, OK? When John Rawls tried to defend himself that his theory was political, he said, it's interesting. He didn't say at first his theory is political not moral. He wrote, he said his theory is political, not metaphysical. Okay? 
But what's bizarre is then when he tries to show it's not metaphysical, he tries to say it comes out of the values of American society. But then he sets up American society as Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau. <laughs> as if American society didn't have Nez Perce, Cherokee, Navajo, that it didn't have people who were Ashante, you know, um, Talense, Ibu, that Yoruba coming in, that it didn't have, and even within that, that it didn't have uh, people who were coming from um, um, Ruism or Confucianism, people who were coming from Hinduism, all of it. American society simply became a tiny part of Northern Europe when actual American society had all these people together. So it's very weird if you're going to say it's not, it's not uh, metaphysical, it's based on the society, then the society should look honestly like this room right now. Because even though we're, in, we're, we're, we're right now in Coimbra, the fact of the matter is that many of you reflect the globe in interesting ways. You see? So why in the world did he artificially make America a tiny set of white guys was already a, a fallacy. He then wrote a book called Justice as Fairness, a Restatement. And in Justice as a Fairness, he put it to the forefront that he was going to show that his theory was political, not a moral theory. Now, the reason people like myself say it was a moral theory was because his principles were like moral rules. Morals are about rules you follow. Okay? Morals about, are about rules that constrain action. Ethics is more complicated. Ethics is about your ability to evaluate the moral rules, to obey or disobey them. Okay? So the problem is, if you're going to look at society as two rules, and people follow them, that you individually, without any conversation with people, do, that's like coming as Moses with the tablets for political life. However, in a way, Rawls was committing a very important fallacy that goes all the way back to Plato. Because you see, a lot of people don't realize this, and Hannah Arendt does a good job of pointing this out. She argued the difference between Plato and Socrates was that Plato wanted to have the, the polis, the society, constrained by knowledge. Okay? He wanted the Calipolis because people were living in Cacopolis, and Kaka is what it means, right? And that the idea was to find out who has the right answers that everybody will follow. But she pointed out that Socrates went and argued with people because truth for Socrates wasn't about something floating. Political truth emerges from interaction. Okay? And that's the crucial difference. And so the problem Rawls basically said is that he was going to now address the political issue. And here is where the fundamental problem. He makes the same mistake that many people in decolonial studies make and lots of others make. When he went to the side to show that he was going to do a political philosophy, he had to address a fundamental issue in politics. And the re in other words, the reason I and many others argue that liberal political philosophy is not political philosophy is because if you read most liberals, in fact, all of them, there is something they do not talk about that's fundamental for politics. The thing they don't talk about is power. It's amazing. If you read almost all, read Habermas, read all of them, Sandel, all of them. Even, even, even some of the black ones, like Charles Mills, all of this stuff, but no power. And this is bizarre. Really think about it. If there's one thing you need for politics to exist, it's power. If you take power out, then it's all about moral regulation. And so this is the crucial part. This is now where we're going to diverge. Because, you see, when Rawls himself tried to answer it, it's interesting, if you read his early work, he talked about society in terms of the general will, reflective equilibrium, reason, all those things. But when he decided to be political, he went to Hobbes, 
Uh, I guess we ran out of air. Uh, yeah, we're going to open. Uh, yes. yeah, I guess we have an air conditioner. It went off. Yes, it's the. Uh, oh, oh, it just. Yeah, we could open the. If I'd open the windows. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Okay. We open the door too. Let it circulate. <laughs> I know how to talk loud. So here's the problem. When he went to look about power, the way he talked about power was as coercive. You see what I'm getting at? In other words, if you look at the world of Hobbes, Hobbes saw people like bowling balls colliding with each other. And so it became a matter of the biggest bowling ball colliding with the others to get them to behave. This is the problem with the isolated individual model. You're all by yourself, and the only thing that will stop you is something bigger than you. And it becomes the issue of stopping you. You see what I'm saying? And that's why those models of freedom is getting things out of the way. So you can just roll with no obstacle. That is where the problem is. Because you see, if power could only be coercive, then politics must be negative. It means the state, all those things must be bad. Okay? So, is that correct? Well, now we move to another person. Let's go to Franz Fanon. So now we go south. Okay? Now, we already know the hypocrisies of most liberal thought. One of the hypocrisies is liberal thought wants to be so formal that it doesn't deal with people the way people really are. This is one of the reasons why it's bad for if we talk about racism or sexism, because it would only look at you as a formal abstraction. The other, there, there, there are loads of other problems. It doesn't talk about colonialism, because ultimately, again, it's this abstraction. In history, all these things don't come in. Well, Fanon comes in, and Fanon right away says certain interesting things. Interesting point number one. From Fanon, but not only Fanon, there are others who argue this, but I'm just using Fanon as an example. From Fanon, Fanon argues that colonialism actually had an impact on life the way I talked about capitalism. First of all, colonialism did not only colonize people materially in terms of constraining their action. For Fanon, colonialism also worked at the how, at how you talk about the world. In other words, the very methodology of how you play the game was colonized. And so that means then you could end up changing the players in a decolonial practice, but if you have the same game, you're producing colonization. That's, right? That's Fanon's first critique. But Fanon has another one. Fanon argues that what colonialism did is exactly what I said that is the aim of capitalism. Colonialism's enemy is the human being. And the, if the reason the human being is its enemy is the same reason the market had to get rid of the human being in order to be efficient and functional. Because, you see, the human being ultimately um, for, for, for colonialism to work, the human being has to, has, to be, has to be brought out of human relations. Now, what do I mean? Well, if you look at a lot of the metaphysics, a lot of the, the, the stuff in, in Euro-modern philosophy, it's as if the human being can be studied like this glass of water or this bottle. However, as we know, we're born animals. But humans live in a world, Fanon pointed out, that's conditioned by sociality and language. In other words, if there are no relationships, no human being will emerge. You'll just have a biological mass with senses. Relationality means that every time a human being interacts with another human being, new relationships are being produced. The problem is that colonialism and capitalism are designed to push human beings out of relations. You see the logic? And so what happens is, colonialism has as its logic contraries, Aristotelian contraries. 
In other words, all are and none are. And that's why all colonialisms lead to forms of segregation. The idea is that the dominating people must be universal and pure, which means the dominating people are not universal and separate. Any moment of interaction is a contradiction to the system. So colonialism tries to impose non-interaction. In effect, then, the, 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 the enemy at a logical level of colonialism is dialectical. It's dialectical because a dialectic to occur requires a contradiction. You see? And it's a complicated thing about this. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into all the details around Marx and Lenin and Gramsci and all that stuff. Fanonian dialectics is rather interesting because what Fanon said is that even the European dialecticians, many were actually presuming a closed dialectic. But a closed dialectic for Fanon is a contradiction of terms. To be properly dialectic is, is to be open, which means this. You all have heard, everybody has learned what I call bad Hegelianism. Bad Hegelianism tells you you have a thesis, right? You have the antithesis, and you have the synthesis. That is bad Hegelianism. What Fanon points out is this. When you have a contradiction, what a contradiction makes you realize is what you thought was universal was not. It doesn't follow that from that the movement is singular and linear. It means what you discover is there are many directions you can now go in, and the contradictions of those directions lead to other directions. That is huge, because that is telling you that the realization of contradictions is an expression of freedom. This is why Fanon could say to the communists in France that black people don't have to become white European workers before we can become free. There are people who argued against fighting against colonialism because they said in, in Africa and in South America and parts of Asia that there wasn't an industrial proletariat. Fanon's response is that's not dialectical. You can have a revolution fighting against whatever kind of oppression is there by bringing out the contradiction and building something new. You see the difference? So you could already see how he's going to respond to Rawls, even though he's, he died before Rawls. You know, I mean, I mean, Rawls was and he were writing at the same time, but but they didn't re, you know talk with each other at all. But but here is now where Fanon moves in an interesting direction. So once you realize this dialectic, now let's look at it in a very crucial issue. Let's pick racism. Racism, in, in its basic element, is very straightforward. Racism is a group of people identifying a group of human beings and then imposing upon them the, the notion that they're not human. You know, people have all kinds of fancy theories about racism, but racism is very straightforward. When racism exists, someone is telling you you're not human. Now, what's crucial here is this is the contradiction of racism. People don't walk up to dogs and do racism against dogs. Because a dog's a dog. They don't do it against cats and trees. You see what I'm getting at? In order for racism to exist, you must identify a human being and then deny at the same time that human being. OK? So now we have the ball rolling, right? So one has to point out the contradiction. That's why there is a dialectical phenomenology in, in, in anti-racist theory. So here's the big problem that racism creates, that Fanon points out. Racism creates a category of people who are selves and others. Now already this puts Fanon outside of the realm of many people today who talk about racism. Because for many people, they think the problem of racism is that some people are what they call the other. Fanon says no. If you are an other, that means that you are in an ethical relationship with another. Something wrong can be done to others. For racism to exist, you must have people who are selves 
people who are others, and then another category of, pe of, of people who are not self and not others. And he calls that the zone of non-being. Now think about it. If you're not a self and not another, that means you're outside of the realm of ethics and morals. That means anything can be done to you and it would not be considered a violation of morality. You see what I'm getting at? But there's a flip side to this problem. Let's pick settler colonialism. Settler colonialism says this, that the colonizing situation is just, it is right, it is good. If it is so, then it doesn't have to be changed. So that means then that if you try to change it, you are violating what is just, good, and right. So the first problem pops up from the moralistic and the justice position is those positions don't work for social change. Because social change by definition means you have to change the system. But why should you be changing a just, good system? You see? That means then the appearance, that, that's a system then that sustains itself in the non-appearance of the people in the zone of non-being. And in fact, you could see it empirically. A lot of colonial history is also a racist history against the appearance of certain people. Their very appearance is treated as violence. And this is why Fanon in Le Dagne de la Terre, The Damned of the Earth, opened the book on violence. He was trying to show that in a system that makes your very appearance violence, this is what's happening in the United States where, the, I mean, where, where the literal appearance of, of black people, particularly black men, makes a police officer say he's defending himself. This is the same thing in a world where the appearance of a black man in the room makes people think of sexual violence. The very appearance, you see? So Fanon says, if you're going to convince that world that you're not violent, the best way to convince it is to not do anything, is to keep the system intact. But if you're going to change it, if you're going to change it, then every effort to change it is going to be read as violence. That is why Fanon says decolonization is always a violent phenomenon. People thought he meant that it means you must go around and shoot and stab and kill people. No. He's not saying, he's not ruling out that people do that, but he's saying no. And one of the reasons we know that's not what Fanon meant is because later in the book, after he goes through his long analysis, he gives examples of Algerian revolutionary liberation people who did atrocious acts of violence. And he's not romanticizing them. In fact, he's describing them as trauma, okay? So if we come back to violence now, Fanon says something very interesting. What he says is that we must understand that colonialism has erected what he called a Greco-Latin pedestal of ethics. And what he means by that is this. If you look at the liberal formula that says it has to be around morality for the regulation of political life, then you can only do something where the morality must supersede, not the political change. So it has to be morality over politics. In effect, then, you maintain, through liberal political philosophy, colonialism. However, if you say you're going to change it, what Fanon says, what you have to do is to make political action supervene over morality. And you have to accept that everything you do would be read by the governors as violence. Now this becomes crucial because at this moment now, Fanon is asserting a political philosophy. You see? Now, now the crucial question comes, what the hell does political philosophy mean? What is it that makes it political? Because even though I've talked about morality, I haven't answered what makes something political happen. Well, one of the things about the political you all know is that if you look at its history, its etymology, its, the, politics is related to the polis. You already know that. 
Okay? And if you look at the city-state, uh, the city-state is a very crucial concept because a lot of people don't know the word citizen preceded city. A lot of people think when they walk around they see big buildings, they think those are cities. That's not cities. Those are just buildings. Cities are places where citizenship takes place. So when citizenship is happening, this, the, 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 the organization of power around citizenship is what produces politics. Now, politics is very complicated here because, you see, for politics to emerge, there has to be the negotiation of power. But if power, but that negotiation of power has to be done through language, discursively. Okay? Where you do it through force, where, where language breaks down, you have civil war. Okay? So the argument for politics is there's a place in which you have suspended violence, ironically, through fighting by me, dealing with power by means of words and language, speech. And Aristotle talked about this, many others. Now, here is where we go decolonial, right? There are two, two points, right? I'm going to do a decolonial point, but then I'm going to come to a critique of decolonial, okay? Here's a decolonial moment at an etymological level. If we stop there, we have reified the notion that everything begins with the Greeks and the Latins. However, to understand, to understand the two things happening with politics, you need to understand power and speech. Okay? Well, the first thing, let's, let's think about why speech. Well, among the ancient Athenians and those groups, the term they used for the, the anti-political, the non-political person was, do you know the term? Idiotes. <laughs> Idiotes. <laughs> it, it, it means the non-political person. <laughs> so you could already see the issue, right? Modern capitalism, modern colonialism, modern liberal political theory is trying to give you a recipe to be an idiot. Because the more you're not engaged in public, relational, political life, you become private into yourself with your opinion, your morals, your stuff. For, for, for the ancients, that's to be an idiot. However, it, they got that term from, Af it was from an African term. It wasn't, in other words, a lot of the, the, the Greek-speaking people, by the way, this may sound shocking to you, today they're Greeks, but in the past they weren't Greeks. There were different peoples who spoke with the Greek language. So the people we know from who study were looked a lot like this room. They were multiracial people speaking the Greek language. But one of the myths is connected to how we studied the past through Indo-European languages. You see, when biology failed to give us polygenesis, the next retreat from the Aryans and the Teutonism, in other words, the kind of fascist way of thinking, was to create a new polygenesis, the idea of absolutely independent languages coming out of uniquely European sources. However, when I go and look up the archaeology, a lot of so-called Indo-European comes out of Africa. And one of these is from the language of Mudaneter. And in that language, the word that led to idiotis was the word ide, I-D-I, ide. And the word ide means deaf. Now this is crucial. Because, as many of you know, when you do look at the post-colonial theory and post modernism you know about Gertrude Spivak. She says, can the subaltern speak? A lot of people miss it. Of course the subaltern can speak. The issue she's really raising is, are the subaltern listened to? Politics cannot emerge without being heard. And so for a lot of these people, if you can't listen, you see what I'm saying? then the negotiation of power disappears. I'll put sign language to the side. There's all kinds of other things there. But the presumption then is if you are isolated off to yourself, you're not public, you're not part of the public presentation of power. Okay? But then the next word is crucial, power. If you look at the word power, a lot of people look at it back from the word, from, for instance, pote or potency. Right? Like, like that's why people talk about impotence, which is non-power, potency, omnipotence, all-powerful. However, that word itself also is not European, well, today we say they weren't European, but it's not 
actually Greek or Latin in origin. It also was from Buddha and Turkey. It's from the word pate, P-H-T-Y. I mean, that's how you translate it, right? I mean, transliterate it. And pate is rather interesting because, you know, it's funny. In the, in the Romance and languages, in the Germanic languages, there's a limited number of words for power. But in the ancient African language, these words, a lot of them had like 36, 40 words, all over the place words. But pate referred specifically to the power of kings. Okay? So it's about government power. Okay? But even there it's tricky because you see, power there was not like in the body of a king or a queen or a god even. Power was linked to another term, which is called heka. And heka is from which you get the word like hex, which is often today translated as magic or witches and things like that. But it's related to the word ka, which means living force. And what it means is this. Even a god or a king or a queen or anybody with power has to have within it something that makes power active. You see? Now, I bring this up because today when we talk about power, especially in a lot of theoretical work, uh, this is part of the unfortunate hegemony of Eurocentrism. You notice almost nobody could talk about power today without talking about Foucault? You think he invented power, and some get really creative. They say, no, 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 not just Foucault, Nietzsche. You know? But you notice a lot of people talk about power, but they never define power. And this is, because of this failure to define power, is why Hobbes, uh, not Hobbes, Rawls could just go to Hobbes and talk about coercion, coercive control over others. But all power means, if you look at the story I just told of power, is the ability to make things happen. That's all power is. And with the ability to make things happen, it's rather interesting, because early humanity, and humanity today realized something. If I look at my, my power by myself, in my individual embodiment, then my power, my ability to make things happen, is only as far as I could physically reach. You see? However, human beings created language. So now, my and your power can fill this room because of our ability to interact. And then the social world has power, because of its ability to expand meaning, and power invested in things we create in the social world, like institutions, governments, class, knowledge, all those things are power. Power, in other words, expands the human ability to make things happen in the world. You see how that's very different from the Hobbesian model. People have been, uh, right, it, on the liberal model, if you're gonna make yourself only like a god, then you're going to resent the fact that there are people with power beyond you. So, for instance, a president, a prime minister, or a mayor has jurisdictional power. Human beings now have power that take us into the stars. Okay? So power expands what you can do. Power is more like empowerment. Power is a good thing. In fact, Freud looked at power in an interesting way. For Freud, power was about the ability to do, to create a prosthetic God. What you look for from God is the ability to protect you from the elements, and make your body healthy, protect you from your self, and also to help you deal with other people. In other words, for Freud, the source of misery often is, is your interaction with others, so God gives you laws. Okay? Well, that's what government does. Governing institutions deal with laws through which you can deal with the elements, your body, and each other. Okay? So that's, so power is a good thing. So if you have power and the, and the expansion, power is fundamentally part of the human world. That's what I'm trying to lead up to. So anything that's anti-human tends to be anti-power, which ultimately then leads to the receding of power and disempowerment. In fact, what colonialism and racism are is the historical concerted effort to disempower whole groups of people. So it's ridiculous to tell those people to be anti-power. It means, in effect, for them to, to concede the loss of their humanity. Okay? So now I get to the last point in done. 
Remember when I said there was this problem with the way Huck, the way uh, Rawls just said, justice is the primary virtue of social institutions. He also committed a fallacy. He committed the same fallacy that I was criticizing when people stop at a certain point in Europe for terms. Okay. So, for instance, he just simply pre presumes when he says justice, he's talking about, say, what Machiavelli talked about, which would be, say, what uh, Seneca talked about, which would be, say, what Plato talked about. But the fact of the matter is that if you look at the ancient Greek term, dike, which is often when he's looking at the term dikaisune, that term, right, the beingness of doing things right, so to speak, is more connected to a mudaneta term, ma'at. And ma'at referred not only to balance, but to truth, and also to humaneness. It, had, it was a large constellation of relations that had justice as a subcategory. You see what I'm getting at? So the problem that happens when you, the way justice is evoked is that in the liberal model, a very particular concept is being imposed on the rest of humanity. And so in effect, we're trying to squeeze the rest of the normative life of human beings into justice. Instead of seeing how justice is just a subcategory of that broader view. If we understand this, that means that justice in that model is a colonizing concept. And we see this a lot. If you think about a lot of civil rights and decolonial movements, the error people make is to think that the, that the achievement of justice in that circumstance is both necessary and sufficient. But what many people discover is that although they may have a system of justice, because the structure doesn't make them enter the discourse as human beings, justice could be consistent with their exclusion. A good example is when you think of Kantianism. A Kantian says, I'm going to be law-like, categorical, absolute. And you can apply it universally. You just say, I'm referring to universal rational beings, it's just as those people are rational. You can, you can consistently apply most of those liberal principles with the exclusion of most of humanity. Now some people say, oh no, no, just put humanity in. But that's the same error. I'll give you an example. And, right? If we put it, look at the example in terms of gender as an example. Many people presume you could just put women in and you'll have the system just. What many people don't realize is that the system is a relationship. If you're going to make women fit that system neatly, you'll now turn women into men. Women as women require a different relationship to that system. I can give you the example in a different way. I love this example. A man and a woman go on a date. It's a good date. You know it's a good date because she twirls her hair, you know? He's, and he flexes his shoulder. They laugh, they chatter. And at the end of the date, he said, I had a good time. She said, I had a good time. He said, this is one thing would make it perfect. And she says, what? And he said, if I could just stop seeing you as a woman, I could respect you. <laughs> Do you think there's going to be a second date? <laughs> Because it's obvious, if he cannot respect woman, he's misogynist. But think about it. With race, that's what's always imposed. People say, you can be better in race if you could stop seeing black people as black, brown people as brown, Arabs as Arabs, etc. But that is racism. That's liberal racism. Liberal racism says you can be respected if you're not seen. You see? So now, let's start doing some seeing. And one of the things that you begin to see when you begin seeing is that we have a lot of the history. And this is, this is what I'd like you to consider. 
We have a false history of colonialism. Here's the false history. The colonizer comes in, the colonized is colonized, colonialism goes on, then there's independence, and then the, 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 the colonized open their eyes and say, where did we leave off? Okay? So this has been an old problem. So at this moment, the question is, should I just be like the colonizer? And also people say, no, now we have to go back 500 years or whatever to be like what we were. But that's a fallacy. Because in that example, colonized people are not agents. They're not human beings. Now let's pick another example. The colonizer comes in. The, the colonizer comes in with the colonizer's norms. Christians, as an example. The Caribs, Tainos, different groups, they have their world. And in their world, each, each one are modern in the sense that they expect to inhabit the future. However, when colonialism occurs, one group says, no, we're the future, you're the past. And that's how the primitive is, cre is created. However, from the point of view of the people on which primitivism is imposed, they're using their value system to say, what the hell is going on? And while they're using their value system, they're learning the other value system. You see what I'm getting at? And this is crucial because there's a fallacy of how cultures meet, how people meet, that has dominated how we talk about these issues. The fallacy is the fallacy of isomorphism. And what that fallacy is, is, is absolute translation. So it means that you have one society with its language, another society with its language, they meet and you map on the languages like these, ten, these five fingers match onto these five fingers. There's no, if that could only exist if each society knew everything. However, what more, most often happens is this. <laughs> People meet and some things match up and a lot of things don't. And the things that don't match up what people do is not translate, they learn. In other words, the colonized had to learn new things. The colonized had to learn new things. It's just that the colonizer is invested in saying, I know everything. However, the people along the way, and because the colonizer says, I know everything, the colonizer says, and colonizing you is good. And, and, and I don't need to study you anymore. I have the answers. But the colonizer now has to deal with a new kind of norm. The colonizer has to take the colonization of norms seriously. The colonizer also has to have humility to the old norms. Say, look, this is what we believe, but this is what we're living. If we're going to inhabit the future, who will we be? And now we begin to see what Jane in the back of the room, Jane Gordon and others have argued as creolization, which is that what you are is a very much modern subject, but your modernity is not the one of a neat, pure, imposed modernity. Yours is the dialectical modernity of trying to figure out what norms would make you alive in the future. You see? And so if you look at women as an example, you know that example I gave you put women into a system? The error with that is that they think that women and men are the same. But if the system is designed for men, then the error is if women are to go in, women have to leave behind something. However, if women don't, what are the other things that tend to come along historically with women? in a patriarchal or a sexist society. The other thing that comes along with women is that women are historically sites of sex and sexuality. It's no accident that as women become a, become, become a transformation of the norms, a society that thought it was bringing in women, heterosexual women, didn't realize it was also bringing in relations of sexuality. And that is one of the reasons why sex and sexuality is so much part of the contemporary political discourse. You see? Well, not only sex and sexuality, but in what 
the peoples who became dominated by colonialism had no reason to see themselves as indigenous peoples before. They had no reason to see themselves as black or brown. They were, they were as I mentioned earlier, Taino, Caribs, Ozas, Talense, Shona, you know, these kinds of things, Tuana. And similarly, the people up here were from the past, everything from Vandals to, you know, Gaelic speaking to all kinds of other groups. And so what begins to happen is that all of those constellations have with them all kinds of histories and baggages that begin to now raise new norms, no new values, and we're seeing it. What is happening, I am arguing, is that the colonial moment is also a moment of collision and produces new kinds of human beings. And every new kind of human being is not a thing, but a norm. In other words, so if you're going to decolonize knowledge, you also have now, if the critique of you decolonize justice, it means the normative life to come may require different kinds of questions of how we relate to society and normative life. You see? And so beyond justice is about the production of new relationships of new kinds of human beings. And I think this is a new kind of task. And this is where Fanon and many others offer a very interesting insight. Because what Fanon argued, remember I said Fanon says decolonization is violent? What Fanon also says is that those who are indigenously linked to decolonization, their skill sets are not the right skill sets for a genuine post-colonization. Because their skill sets are intimately linked to violence for its legitimation. If you want a post-violence type of world, you need to now produce different kinds of relations with skill sets that are about establishing a, diff, a, a different, um, um, the expansion of, not expansion of the word, the flourishing of empowerment, which is not simply about justice, but it has other normative concerns, such as health, compassion, maturity, and a variety of other concepts that are in other languages, for instance, Ubuntu in South Africa. Well, not just South Africa, it's across Southern Africa because Zimbabwe, other places, have terms similar, okay? It has terms like Uhuru, it has all kinds of other terms that, it's not to exoticize them, it's to understand those terms are now part, are being developed to deal with a genuine post-colonial situation. And I'll stop there. <laughs>